Hello and welcome to the second webinar hosted by Vic Notil, focusing on relevant issues around soil carbon through a closer look at strategies to increase soil organic matter. This project is supported by Wimmera CMA through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. We would really like to thank them very much for their support. For those that missed last week's webinar with Jade, we have it recorded and it's available on our YouTube channel. Um, today, we're fortunate enough to again be joined by Jade, um, but we've also been joined by Zoe Crouch, who farms at Landsborough, and Tara Henson, who farms at Neripur. Today, we'll hear from Jade for 15 minutes, and then from Zoe and Tara for 15 minutes each about their experiences with cover cropping. If you have any questions as we go, uh, could you type them uh, and who it's directed to into the Q&A box down the bottom of your screen? And we'll have a Q&A segment at the end where the panel can answer them. Uh, so for, without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Jade back to the webinar. So welcome, Jade. Thank you, Dan. I'll just uh, share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, so um, this week I'll, I'll keep it pretty short and sweet, but I just thought I'd talk about uh, starting on farm with, with multi-species or, or cover crops. So um, roughly uh, my approach to starting on farm and, and some assessments and return on investment stuff that you can do to make sure that you're keeping an eye and, and benchmarking your multi-species against uh, your standard practice. Uh, so we'll go through starting multi-species on the farm, some of the assessment basics, and then a bit of return on investment stuff uh, if you're that way inclined. So if you're starting multi-species on the farm, it's I find the easiest way to do it if, if you're wanting to, to benchmark um, the multi-species and, and keep an eye on the numbers is to do a side-by-side a -side trial or a split paddock trial, so either splitting a paddock in half or having a paddock side-by-side -side with another paddock with a similar soil type uh, obviously the same rainfall, you'd hope, uh, so that you can really tell what's happening with the multi-species versus your, your standard practice approach. So I often have people or farmers pick a bad paddock, which is fine, um, but bear in mind that that bad paddock is a bad paddock. So sometimes farmers are a bit disappointed with how the multi-species is going in the first couple of years, but it's gone into, into a challenging paddock. So if you want to see what it will do on on the majority of your farm, try and pick an average paddock. It's fine to pick a bad paddock, but just bear that in mind um, when the multi-species starts to grow because potentially there is some um, sense of disappointment there, but it's probably more the paddock rather than the multi-species. So if you're really wanting to get an idea for what it will do for you on the majority of the farm, try and pick an average paddock and use an approach that's fit for purpose. So that's all around um, the particular seed that you're using. Make sure that it's suitable for the the time of the year that you're sowing it. Um, if you if you need some fert and you're using convention uh, and you're using fert on the conventional side, it's not a bad idea to match that on the multi-species side uh, and cultivation as well. So we'll talk a little bit more about cultivation later. But cultivation or a chemical approach is important if you're going into a into a paddock that hasn't been um, worked up before or worked up for a long time or hasn't been sprayed out. So it is really important to get that cultivation or that control at the start um, before you put the multi-species in because it can really affect how the multi-species goes. Uh, so manage the conventional side as normal as you normally would. Um, sometimes farmers change uh, that conventional side a little bit as well, but try and keep it as you have managed it in the past so that you get a really good idea of the split between the two and also determine your baseline. So what I mean when I say determining the baseline is assess your paddock first. So uh, ident if, you've got, if it's a pasture paddock, um, identify the base pasture species in that paddock. They'll often tell you a little bit about the soil conditions uh, and what's happening in the paddock and identify why they're thriving. So if, if, it's, a, if it's a desirable pasture paddock that's fine um, you've got desirable species in there they're thriving that's a good sign of soil health if it's a weedier paddock or a more challenging paddock those weeds can often tell you a little bit about the soil constraints that you've got so try and identify what is thriving and then as a follow-on why they're thriving uh, get a soil test done zero to ten centimeters is fine you can go deeper if you like but certainly that zero to ten will give you a good idea of your carbon and your nutrients in that um, in that 
shallow root zone and it will give you a really good baseline um, in terms of assessing whether you're building carbon or not, which is obviously a really important thing. Um, do a visual soil assessment if you can. So I'll flick through that my last slide uh, is, is a few books that I find quite helpful. So the visual soil assessment is an, is an actual book and it's very helpful in terms of, of heading out into the paddock and really identifying your soil. While you're there, you can obviously check for compaction as well, whether there's um, compaction at a shallow level or a deeper level, and whether that's going to whether that's going to impact on your on your establishment of your multi species. So, um, if it's going to be a real problem, perhaps address that before you go in. So it's all about identifying um, where the paddock is at before you start, and whether there are any constraints that you need to intervene. So whether when you get the soil test back done, whether there's something really out of whack in terms of a nutrient level or whether there's a hard pan uh, or whether there's some weed species that you need to get after. So um, really give it the best chance you can and, and set a, a neutral sort of baseline so you can really determine what's going on in the future. So paddock prep, uh, this is the big thing for me. Um, this is what I find uh, the most challenging. Um, for people. If, if the multi-species is having a tough time, it's usually because of paddock prep. Um, that's sometimes from a, a goal-oriented point of view. There's a lot of farmers going down the region pathway that would like to do as little harm as possible, uh, and that sometimes means direct drilling into an active pasture. But unless, uh, unless all the, the factors align, that's very difficult to do. So Often, um, if we're a bit more aggressive at the start, particularly in those sort of first couple of years, the multi-species performs a lot better and then we can start to back off. But we have to prepare the paddock properly, especially in those first few years. So intervention, either cultivation-wise or chemically, is often needed, especially if we are going into a pasture phase. If we're going into, if we're um, for some reason going into, into a cropping paddock that that is going back into a pasture phase, that's a lot easier to do. But if we're going into a pasture paddock, that has, especially that hasn't been touched for a little while, we really do need to, to get a bit aggressive with our intervention. Um, why direct drilling doesn't really work is that a lot of the time during our year, uh, our base pasture is competitive and that will really stop those seedlings getting going. They might germinate and, and get up a couple of inches, but that pasture... Um, is already there and quite active and steals nutrients and moisture away. Uh, if we choose a time of the year where the base pasture, if we're still talking pasture paddock, where that base pasture has um, has run out of puff, has become dormant, we, we're working with a lot lower soil moisture then because usually we're talking about our autumn and winter active pastures running out of puff in late spring or summer. So we're really starting to get into the pointy end of the season then and we're running out of moisture. So direct drilling into active pastures can be really, really tricky and it doesn't often work. Uh, a lot of the time there's also a, a real wish for farmers on the regen side to, um, to get away from synthetic chemicals and fertilisers. And that is a good goal, but again, it's uh, it's a slow process. So I would much prefer to gradually wean off those inputs rather than cold turkeying them, because that's when we see a real uh, impact on our on our productivity and our profitability as well. As I said before, if you're setting up a trial and you've done a split paddock or a side by side trial, you've got your your benchmark um, paddock or strip, but really if you can try and use that to judge your progress so that control area or that control paddock um, beside the paddock that you're testing will really help you benchmark that multi-species in terms of soil health and also profitability as well so it's a really good way um, to judge whether the multi-species is working for you and and especially over time whether there's a cumulative benefit or not uh, so this is just an example of um, direct drilling into an active pasture. And this, this was actually something that I wanted the farmer to do. Um, he'd sprayed out most of the paddock and I said to him, it would be really good visually just to leave a little strip and just direct drill into that. So uh, obviously you can see this is um, this is a late spring. So this was sown on the 25th of November. It is down um, in Southern Vic. So we have a, a base pasture that is active for a little bit longer, um, but this base pasture is full of um, pretty early um, senescing rubbish. Uh, it's it's quite a challenging paddock, and um, and the competition in late November was enough to really just 
have that multi-species just not established. So uh, on the left-hand side in the left-hand picture, um, you can see the multi-species. You can see that really clear line from the spray to the no spray. So um, the right-hand side is just a close-up of that. So there's a couple of chicory plants and a little bit of millet and the odd sunflower, but really it was a complete failure and the only difference is, is some Roundup. Um, so do it's just a really good visual. So a lot of the times this is what I see on farm is the direct drilling is is into an active pasture and it doesn't have to be particularly active, but it really impedes um, the establishment of that multi-species. So uh, if you're thinking about doing a direct drilling, especially into an active pasture that hasn't been cultivated before, um, just be aware of it a little bit. Maybe do a little test strip so that you can see before you do it on a large scale. Uh, so assessment tools wise, um, these are a few uh, simple things that you can use. So obviously um, your shovel is your best friend. So getting out and really knowing your soil and what's happening in your soil um, is really valuable. You can tell a lot just from looking at the soil in terms of um, soil health. So whether there's worms in it, the colour and the smell of it, the friability of it, you can and you can easily do that over time. So you can measure that. <clears throat> You can measure that quite easily over time as well. So a shovel is just really handy. Um, chuck it in the back of the ute and, and just head out to your paddocks and it's a five-minute process just to benchmark what's happening out there. Um, as a follow-on to that, if you happen to have a copy of the Visual Soil Assessment by Graham Shepherd or you'd like to buy one, it is a really easy um, process to visually assess your soil and it's a really good benchmarking process as well so that book is really really helpful um, from an assessment point of view for your soil health your phone everyone's got one um, it's usually in your back pocket or your chest pocket uh, and that camera function is fantastic so uh, it's a two second job to if you've got a split paddock to stand on the split um, between your conventional and your your multi-species and take a few photos um, so that camera really comes in handy it's it's um, date stamped and time marked and really simple process to, to provide you a record over time of what's happening. Um, the other one you can do, which doesn't take up um, too much time and, and um, there's no calculation in, in Excel spreadsheets, pretty much is grazing days. So uh, if you've got a split paddock trial, um, you can keep an eye on the, the production from both of those sides just with grazing days if you've got livestock. So I'll talk about some other methods of measuring dry matter but grazing days is a really easy way um, you don't have to do a lot of measurement there it's just keeping an eye on when the stock go in and when the stock come out um, this is this is just an example of of how um, relevant pictures can be and how easily they can be to establish a record so um, this is the same paddock with three different treatment strips in it uh, taken on the same day so on the left hand side we've got the control um, which was basically onion grass and capeweed and a bit of sorrel. Um, so there's not a lot going, going on there. Uh, and then the rest of the paddock was offset disc and sown to multi-species. So um, this is, I find um, establishing a photo point really good. So these are just a couple of canes in here that are that are within the strips, but they're a really good way visually um, as a known size object, just to be able to um, assess your, your growth relatively easily just by taking a photo. So um, you can see the control versus the middle strip was just bare multi-species seed. So no fertilizer in this strip uh, and no seed coating. And then the right-hand side here, um, looking a bit more vigorous, was the same uh, multi-species seed mix, but uh, coated with worm juice on the seed. And then it had a foliar of worm juice. So you can easily, you can walk across the paddock in, in five minutes and just take a photo. And if you've got some strips in the paddock that are different uh, and really easily determine what's going on um, from a photo point of view. So just a really good way to establish a record. Uh, so if you're wanting to really assess um, what's happening during your comparison phase or your trial phase, really do take pictures, um, use the monitoring point uh, with with an object of known size, it doesn't have to be a, a pigtail or a, or a star picket, but it can be um, whatever suits you at the time. But uh, if you're using it consistently, it's a really good way um, to keep an eye on what's going on over time. Uh, that growth and yield is really important, obviously from from a dry matter point of view and from a from a success point of view from the cover crop. But also if you're heading out there with the shovel and you've dug your hole to do a little bit of a visual soil assessment. Um, 
take some photos of the soil condition as well because that's quite important too. So it's good to have a record of that and it's good to know whether it's changing over time. So uh, often I can go back to a paddock, check my photos from last time or from last year if it's an, if it's an ongoing trial and um, have a look at the soil condition from previous photos and it actually does visually change over time. So uh, it's a really good idea to take notice of what's above ground and what's below ground uh, in the pictures. If you're also taking note of the amount of ground cover that you've got, that's a good sign. Uh, and also um, biology in terms of below ground biology, worms and, and um, macrobiology as such, stuff you can see with the naked eye, but also what's going on above ground. So your birds and bees and other pollinators, um, the level of insect pests as well. So just all those factors that, that go into comparing the multi-species with the conventional. Uh, if you are of a recording um, mindset, do record uh, what's happening, especially the input costs from each approach. So we really want the multi-species to be financially viable. That's the most important step because if it's not financially viable, um, it, we, we shouldn't really be doing it, I suppose. It's, 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 it needs to be financially viable. It needs to pay its way. So those input costs are, are really important to keep an eye on. If you're grazing, if you've got um, a livestock-based system or a mixed farming system, keep an eye on the grazing days. That's the easiest way um, to assess uh, the multi-species versus the conventional. But you can get into um, tonnage and quality. I'll talk about that a little bit. Weight gain, um, um, comparing the two. And then also keep an eye on your animal health. So um, what their coats are like, what their wool's like, um, their eye, their, you know, your marking, your fertility, all that sort of stuff um, comes into it as well. How often you have to call the vet, whether you get any um, whether you get any carving or lambing issues, all those sorts of things. Uh, if you're doing this on a larger scale, if it's only just a paddock, animal health when they go in and when they go out may change depending on the size of the paddock, but it's a lot um, less easy to pin down if it's not on a larger scale. Um, and make sure you compare back to the control all the time because we really need to see how this multi-species is working on farm and in what particular areas it's either beneficial or negative in some cases. So if you would like to measure feed, obviously there's grazing days, but there's also, um, I find this pretty handy, I still have one in the glove box of you, it's, it's an MLA um, pasture ruler, it's got two sides. Um, the, the front side, I suppose, just quickly is a quick, good measurement of pasture growth. So um, these red sections are perhaps not as important in a multi-species. Obviously, um, the lower biomass section down the bottom here is um, from a grazing perspective point of view. Uh, this sort of when you get into two and a half tonne and, and three tonne is probably less important with the multi-species. So this would be based on a on a conventional pasture. Often I see multi-species at three or four tonnes having quite good quality. So because the mix has a lot of um, a lot of legumes and brassicas in it, we can have it be a lot taller and the quality is better. So don't be too worried about the red there with the multi-species. Um, often it has a much better quality up, up here than a conventional pasture. So, but it's a really good way to measure how much tonnage you've got in your paddock quite quickly, but bear in mind um, the species that you've got and also the density as well. So this will measure height, um, but you do need to keep an eye on your density too. Uh, a lot of what I do in, um, in paddock scale projects is I cut and weigh and then do a feed test. So that's quite an accurate way of doing it, but it is a bit more time consuming. So um, I head out there with a, um, a pair of secateurs or, or you can use a little electric thing, um, Agvic have one of those and you just go, bzz, you know, like shearing a sheep, it's quite amazing. Um, I don't have one of those, I just use a pair of, of, of secateurs or scissors, but you can cut and weigh. So uh, a, a quadrant or a square of known size, um, you cut it, weigh it, and then you can send a feed test off. The feed test gives you um, your protein and energy and also your dry matter. So when it comes back, you can do a, a quick little calculation and determine exactly the tonnage you've got on the paddock. And then you also have the quality of that feed as well. So um, cutting and weighing, it's a little bit more time consuming, but it is a really accurate way of measuring what's on the paddock. Um, by eye measurement, uh, dairy farmers in particular are really good at this anyway, because they, they do this every day. Um, putting paddocks in front of cows. And certainly there's a lot of beef sheep guys that are good at this as well. So bio measurement is just fine. Um, and obviously the more you do it, the, the better you get at it. So 
if you're very good at it, that's just fine as well um, as a measurement. Grazing days is, is probably one of the easier ones. Um, uh, it's consumption for your livestock class. There'll be a, a standard assumption based on the quality of your pasture that they'll consume X amount per head per day. Uh, and you can just multiply that by the number of the head and, and the number of days. So that's a pretty easy calculation where, where you pop the stock in, you know how many are in there, you know how many days they were in there, and you can get an average consumption based on, on their class and the quality of the pasture. So grazing days uh, is, is a relatively easy way to do that, but there are other um, ways of measuring your feed. Uh, if we're talking about doing the sums, so these, these are some of the things um, to think about. So seed costs, uh, we'll, we'll go through an example in a minute, but seed costs are usually equal or a bit dearer than a normal pasture mix. From a cropping perspective, um, cereals are probably cheaper than a multi-species, depending on the mix, but the seed costs are, are not too frightening per hectare. So um, from a production and quality perspective, if we're grazing this, um, the multi-species can be, that can make the multi-species cheaper to grow because they do produce um, biomass into the shoulders of the season. And often um, at certain growth stages, it's higher quality because of the diverse mix and those legumes and brassicas in there. So often that can make the multi-species cheaper to grow when we're crunching our numbers. Um, obviously keeping on inputs and the outputs, so your costs and your production, whatever production measure you choose, um, make sure that, you, that you're looking at it from a conventional and a regenerative point of view. And especially keeping an eye on those input costs is really important. So we really need to determine whether the multi-species is financially viable uh, and, and by how much. And it, we really need to keep an eye on those input costs to do so. So the regen input and production versus the control input and production. And that production measure can be whatever you choose it to be, uh, but it needs to be standardised for both um, the control and the regen. So we'll go through some examples now. Um, this is a, a beef finishing operation down my way, down my neck of the woods near Colac. Uh, and this was a few summers ago. I talked about it last week from a soil carbon point of view. So um, for those of you that didn't, um, that weren't able to attend last week, there was a soil carbon increase under the multi-species compared to the fallow, but also compared to two monocrops, grazing maize and, um, and corn. And um, so that was a good, a, a good win for the multi-species, but this is the, the weight gain um, perspective. So obviously this um, gentleman is, he, well, he's able to weigh his cattle because he's a beef finishing operation, so that's fair enough. Um, but he's kept an eye on his grazing days. So the paddock um, lasted him for 40 days. He's kept an eye on his weight gain and also uh, his income but he's contrasted that with his establishment costs. So he's got uh, everything that he did to the paddock. Um, the seed corn was, was quite expensive. Um, so his, uh, the, the summer max, which is the multi-species, wasn't well, was, was half the cost. So that is quite interesting from, from a crunching numbers point of view and from a grazing perspective um, into the future. Uh, he did say that he'd keep an eye on that in terms of selling again. It might be more multi-species and less of the grazing mazes and corns, um, but he's kept a real uh, input cost record here. And then he can quite easily work out his total costs, um, the weight gain that he had from his cattle, the extra profit based on um, the, the price of beef at the time, and then the profit per hectare and the profit per beast. So it's just a case of input costs versus outputs. So that's a, that's one way to do it is keeping an eye on the weight gain. That's from a beef perspective. And this one and a half kilos a day, um, that's an average. And quite often I see that on the multi-species mixes. So beef cattle are, are quite happy putting on, you know, that one and a half to two kilos a day on these multi-species mixes. That's not a surprising figure. So they are good um, from a weight gain perspective. From a sheep perspective, um, this is actually Cole Sice's work. Uh, he's got an MLA trial um, that he did and he split his paddock. So again, that split paddock um, mechanism. So this is an autumn sown um, trial and a barley crop versus a multi-species crop. So he put in 50 kilos of barley versus 30 kilos of barley and some legumes and brassicas in here. So you can see the rates here. This is quite a good mix. Um, it's roughly 
roughly the ratios that I put in as well. So um, multi-species mix doesn't have to be too complicated. You know, there's, there's six species there um, and that's more than enough uh, from an autumn perspective. You can do a, a few more, but this is quite a nice mix. Um, same fertiliser, so certainly keeping on it and on our inputs and our input costs. And this is what happened. So he had some merino lambs in here. Um, so obviously same livestock class and same number and same amount of grazing days. And then again, he's kept an eye on the weight gain here. So uh, on the barley crop, they on average, they gained 149 grams. And on the multi-species side, they gained 300 grams. So he's, he's um, kept an eye on obviously the prices of the lambs and then uh, his income um, per hectare from that. So uh, versus, uh, minus the cost of sowing. So obviously you can see that multi-species was a little bit more expensive to put in, um, but gave a lot more weight gain. So um, through keeping on his input costs and the weight gain and the prices, he's able to, to pump out that profit per hectare uh, number at the bottom, which is really important. So um, the multi-species was about twice as profitable as the barley crop. So just an example of doing a split paddock trial, but again, keeping an eye on some of those crucial factors and being able to um, punch some numbers out at the end that really benchmarks that multi-species against the conventional. Uh, another way to do that, um, which doesn't rely so much on weight gain, um, which I do on, a lot on dairy, dairy farms, of course, because they're not measuring weight gain. Um, they're measuring milk production. And often they don't, often we're doing this on a fairly small scale, so they don't have enough land to do a really a, a milk production or milk production benefit analysis from the multi-species. So often it's just one or two paddocks. So when it's something like that, or just if this is preferential to you, we can do uh, our input costs versus the tonnage through um, the feed tests and the, the fodder cuts, or we can measure it through the grazing days as well. But this is this is just another way to, to, to crunch those numbers from a return on investment point of view. So this is actually a trial in Gippsland. Um, this is the, uh, we did a few annual uh, sowings first and we've just moved to, to multi-species perennials and a a perennial ryegrass clover mix on the conventional side. So you can see the conventional um, sowing mix there and you can see the multi-species mix there. So uh, quite quite a, um, a, a diverse multi-species blend there from a perennial point of view. Um, but the seed was actually cheaper, which um, actually blew me away a little bit. Uh, I did expect it to be a bit dearer, but it was actually a bit cheaper than the conventional. Um, we did do a Roundup spray here um, which was the same for both sides. Um, we dropped off the DAP uh, from a fertiliser point of view and we put on a little bit of Nutrisol. So we had um, 25 kilos of DAP uh, on this side and 50 kilos on the conventional side. The sign costs were the same and you can see our total starting costs there. So that total starting costs is, is our input costs to date on each side of the trial. And then we can use that from, from a dry matter perspective to get our to get our return on investment. So having that input costs at the start and really keeping an eye on those input costs will help us measure tonnage and then uh, how much it costs us per tonne of feed, dependent on the input costs or from a grazing day's perspective. So it's just another way to do that. Where to now? So if you're really getting excited about this and, and you've, you've mentally bookmarked a paddock, um, learn from the best. So there's lots of lots of YouTube videos and a few books floating around that you can use. So um, Gabe Brown's written a book. Christine Jones is on YouTube everywhere. Nicole Masters has a book and she's on YouTube. Um, Grant Sims is a really valuable resource, the big no-till. Um, there's a lot of really good resources um, out there for you to uh, delve further into multi-species. Use local knowledge as well. So if you've got some farmers that are trying it in your area, you know, really pick their brains. Um, treat the cover like a cash crop or a pasture. So, so give it the best chance of success in terms of, of prepping that paddock and do try and benchmark it to standard practice. So anecdotally, I, I hear a lot of farmers say, oh, well, I think it was better or, or I don't, depending on the result, um, but they haven't benchmarked it. So they can't really tell for certain. So try and benchmark it in some way against that standard practice. Um, from those pictures, establishment's crucial. You have to give it some space. And if you need to give it space, it's it's either from a, a cultivation or a chemical point of view. Uh, if it's going into pasture paddock, there's really 
no way around it unless you are in a in the real minority. Um, so direct drilling can work, but it's it's a very small percentage of times that it works. So give it space in some way if you need to. Um, feed it and then transition to perennial multi-species when possible. So what I mean from that uh, is that the annual multi-species are fabulous, but they're a tool. So um, I, I use them for a certain amount of time until the soil health improves enough to start to establish a perennial multi-species if that's the goal. So um, we're talking more from a grazing perspective now. Um, so the multi-species do help us get our soil health um, firing in and our soil biology active and they help us mimic that more natural pasture environment before we arrive. So once we've done that, we can start to scale back those sowings once our soil health has improved. Uh, and then and then we can start establishing perennials if, if that's the way the paddock is going, if it's going into a more of a pasture-based phase. So the final goal would be to, to mostly abolish the annuals and establish a diverse self-sustaining pasture that's mostly um, a perennial multi-species. So that's the final goal. The annual multi-species are a tool. Um, the final goal from a pasture perspective, if it's going into a pasture rotation, is to make sure that it's diverse and relatively self-sustaining. So um, the annual multi-species is fantastic and it will help you improve your soil health, um, but the end goal is not to have to sow that often. So it's really getting back to perenniality. So I often get asked that question, so I just thought I'd clear that up. Uh, and to finish off, these are some of the, the resources that I found quite valuable. So uh, I've talked about Gabe Brown's book on the left. Nicole Masters is in the middle. Um, there's the Vic Notial magazine that comes out and Graham Shepard's book. So there are just some resources there that you might want to take note of. That's it from me, Dan. No, very good. Thanks, Jade. Um, some fascinating insights there again, some great information that you've shared. Um, just be conscious about time um, to give Zoe and Tara enough time. We might kick straight into that. So uh, I'd like to introduce um, Zoe, or Zoe will introduce herself in her slideshow. But um, yeah, she's been had a lot of experience with, with multi-species cropping. So um, yeah, so would you like to share your screen, Zoe, and get straight into it? Yep, thanks, Dan. Just everyone see that? Yep, that looks good. Okay. Uh, so morning, everyone. Uh, so Luke and I uh, farm at Lansborough West, uh, which is, um, yeah, just uh, on the edge of the Pyrenees um, and the uh, Wimmera, I suppose. So we run up to... Um, that alluvial gold sort of country. So we've got a lot of quartz and ironstone outcrops. Um, we can be quite silty and very prone to erosion without cover. So that's something that's um, been in the back of our mind for a long time. Farming is to try and keep that cover on the ground. Um, so uh, we're low phosphorus, uh, low calcium. Uh, and so that's something that we've been working on over the years. Um, we've got self-replacing merinos, we rear some calves and pasture-raised chooks. Um, we have an average, average rainfall of about 450, but um, I, I, I beg to differ on that at the moment. That's what Mr. Google Pants says, but I'm not sure on that one at the moment. However, we're having a good start to the year. So, um, so this is just a photo of uh, some merino ewes and their lambs coming in. Uh, you can see the uh, lovely crop of onion weed in the foreground. Uh, so this is predominantly what our pastures have been for the last uh, forever. Uh, so this is something that we've wanted to remedy, uh, hence why we jumped in with the mouldy species. Um, Jade says, don't look at your worst paddock, but this is probably the worst one. So um, yeah. Oh, so, so our constraints, uh, basically compaction is our main big one uh, with very sodic soils so they set like concrete in summer they crust over really easily um and uh yeah pop penetrometer in the ground and it, and it doesn't go anywhere so um so very low water infiltration of course um like i mentioned um erosion problems um and the crusting on the surface very low successional plants uh, lots of woody weeds so acacia um problems um, so just really low fertility soil um, and, and just no nutrient cycling. 
Um, so basically our aim uh, with the mouldy species was to try and open the soil up and get some air and water in there, um, increase the biological activity, uh, increase the water infiltration, um, just to take advantage of every rainfall. Um, we do get rain in the summer. Uh, so, you know, if we can, if we can take that on and use it and utilize it, um, at whether it be for grazing stock or not, um, yeah, uh, it's, it, it makes the most sense to me. So, uh, and we also had a huge um, feed gap, obviously due to um, poor pastures and, um, you know, a short, normally a short growing season. Um, so, um, uh, so this is my husband, Luke, trying to get the penetrometer in the ground. Uh, that's the multi species uh, that we planted last year, uh, just coming up. And the photo on the right is not the best photo, but that's pretty much, we hit the compaction layer there. I think it's about uh, eight, um, eight centimetres, maybe 10 centimetres, so 100 mil down. Um, and we really hit that. You can see the rock, uh, it's quite buckshotty in places. Um, so um, yeah, that's, um, uh, that's that one. So, um, so logistics, um, all the paddocks that we sowed the multi species into um, had been hay oat paddocks, uh, bar uh, one, uh, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit, um, but, um, so they'd all been um, soil tested um, previous three or four years. They'd had gypsum and lime applied. Um, they'd been worked. So they'd had a scary bar through and um, had been harrowed. So they had been prepared um, the years before, um, not, not um, aggressively in that we would, we would do this every year, um, but they were, we felt that the soil was good enough that we could run direct drill our mouldy species in um, and, and, and get away with that uh, and, and, and we get a germination, which we did. Um, so we used um, Grant's uh, Super Winter Mix from 21. Um, so uh, trit, uh, trit oats, barley, vetch, peas, beans, arrow leaf clover, tillage radish and balance clover. Um, and it was a really interesting way to watch the, the crop grow through the season. Uh, it was sowed really late May. Um, and, uh, and then of course it got wet. And um, so we had no, um, we had no, um, yeah, we had no chance of getting on it because it had got too wet. And so that was pretty much, um, we didn't get, any more fert on it. So it was sown with um, um, single super and um, uh, 50 kilos a hectare of single super. Um, and the seed uh, was sown at 55 kilos a hectare, but treated with TM germ. So, um, and we'd also applied um, a biological stimulant, um, TM ag, uh, with a knockdown prior. So we had, um, we just used, um, 450 glyphosate, nothing super special, but I feel that because we had gone into um, oat paddocks prior, um, that the, the paddocks were um, ready to receive multi-species crops and we weren't going to run into too many issues except for the one paddock, which I will briefly speak of now. Um, it was a virgin paddock, wouldn't have been worked up in 30 years, um, quite hilly, quartz country, um, and uh, we had... Uh, a huge weed burden come back in on that paddock once um, once the the crop had established, um, but we just didn't get there was there was just not enough nutrient there to get it up and growing. Um, so that's something that I think um, a, a take home is that preparation, like Jade was saying before, preparation is is key. Um, we felt that our paddocks were right to go. So. Um, so the photo on the left uh, is, I believe, I think it was a little oat plant. So that was 15 days uh, germination. Um, and yeah, we were pretty impressed with that root when we dug it up. So um, it was worth a photo. Um, and on the right is the seed mix. Um, so we also um, 
jumping forward, we also uh, put the header over some of our multi species this year, and we've actually got a pretty good um, uh, a pretty good mix, fairly similar to what's in my hand there. So. Um, okay, so uh, the results. So everyone, when we said we were sowing a multi species, they all looked at that seed mix and said, no way will it all run together uh, because, you know, you've got beans and you've got uh, clovers, etc. cetera. Uh, so look, that's not an issue. Um, and we've just got an old combine and it, it ran perfectly well and germinated so evenly across all the paddocks. Um, we didn't need to use any insecticide or fungicide. Um, and like I said, the fertilizer, um, the fertilizer rate was very low because we couldn't get back on. Had we been able to get back on, it would have been a foliar, uh, probably a Nutrisoil um, or a TM foliar fert or something similar to that, um, just to give it that bit of a boost. But it turned out we didn't need to. There was actually a point where the, the plants got to a certain height and then I believe quorum sensing kicked in and the plants just flourished. Um, so uh, we managed to fulfill our feed gap uh, by strip grazing, uh, but I'll talk about that on a photo coming up. Um, the tillage radish grew um, beautifully and did what we wanted it to do, which was to open the soil up and allow um, uh, air and water in. Um, and we, we actually let our paddocks go, um, most of it, not all of it, but some of it to reproductive. Um, and, um, that, that seeded, we've actually managed to have green feed nearly all summer. Um, so that's been, and I'll speak more of that in a minute. Um, we broke up some of the paddocks and trialed them. Uh, in different ways of, of what we could do with the crop. Cause we had so much, uh, biomass we didn't have enough stock and we didn't know what to do with it all we'd only put in 120 hectares but it was a massive amount so um, um so this uh photo on the left um is um our just the diversity i just want to show the diversity of what grew um it was quite phenomenal what, what grew there. And we always uh, come back to happy wife, happy life, but I say happy husband standing in his crop. So um, he was quite chuffed um, standing in there. You can see the triticales got up over his head. So he's 5'11". Um, and yeah, the trits up, the radish was amazing. And the paddocks were alive with, with bugs and insects and all those things. And like I said, we didn't get any... Um, we didn't get any uh, insect infestation of any kind. There was a point where we thought we were going to get hit with red legged, um, but it grew through it. So we were we were uh, most days uh, amazed by the crop. So so just a few things that we did differently um, with the crop, and I'll just um, skip through. So the photo on the left. Um, that width there is a full tractor tire width. So a little bit primitive, but we needed to lay the crop down to be able to put our hot tapes up to strip graze um, cattle. Um, and we basically dragged um, a tire behind the tractor and flattened it. Um, and wherever we have done that, um, the mulch on the ground has been phenomenal. Uh, so it would be in places four inches deep. Um, and we have managed um, that that there has held the water up. Like I said before, we have very low water infiltration. We had a, a pretty major rain event in January. And wherever we had mulch like that, we had water infiltrating into our soil, which we have never had. We would fit, we fill dams all the time uh, because we just set like concrete. But this was really um, pretty exciting. Um, this is my stepdad and my son in the crop. Um, the amazing thing about a multi-species, especially if you've got some legumes in there, is that everyone gets a feed of peas. So this is what they were doing. <laughs> so they, um, the kids would come out with armfuls of, of peas and stand there and eat them. So, um, so uh, that is a tillage radish on the left. So um, that uh, that there is about um, the size of a 1.25 litre soft drink bottle. 
Um, but you can see it's popping out of the ground. So obviously it's hit that compaction layer that we've, we've got um, and, and popped out of the ground instead. But we are still amazed by the, um, the impact it's had. And there was a lot of them. Um, we, were, we were pretty chuffed with them. Um, the cattle love them too. So um, uh, the other one on the right is a volunteer oat. Uh, I think it's an oat, might be barley. Um, that was in January uh, when we had the rain event, uh, which I set, said about that, that normally we would just have run off and never grow anything. Um, and we, uh, we dug that out um, and we're super impressed to see those roots growing um, superbly. So um, yeah, and, and that was because of the layer of mulch I feel so as well. So just a quick comparison. I know we're uh, running, on uh, running on time. Uh, the strip in the middle, middle um, on the left was run down. Uh, we didn't graze that and we uh, ran the tractor over it with, that, with those tractor tyres and knocked it flat. The stuff on the right was grazed and then knocked flat. Uh, so that was after the rain event in January. So you can see the difference. It's, it's phenomenal. So, um, yeah, that's just on a, on a little section down the, down the bottom. So, um, so the future. Um, so basically we're going to try and fit mold species crops in and keep improving our paddocks. Uh, we're amazed by what we've achieved, um, what the, what the plants have done for us. Um, and yeah, and, and it keeps improving. So we are, we are sowing fresh paddocks this year. We actually, what we have done this year is whatever we've let go to reproductive, we are looking after because we we have managed to keep enough cover on the ground. We are looking after, and we've now got about eight inches of, of biomass sitting in our paddocks now, green, lush, ready to go um, with cattle on it, um, which we don't have feed at this time of the year. So, um, yeah, so our aim is to just keep keep uh, introducing these mouldy species into our paddocks uh, and, um, yeah, and feeding uh, nutrient-dense food to our animals and our kids because uh, they love a good feed out of the paddock. So um, yeah, so thank you. How's that, Dan? Yeah, very good. No, some remarkable results there, Zoe. Um, really great to see that uh, when you're doing things like this, you've got to have a win in the first year and um, to, to keep the positivity about. So really great to see, see what you're doing. Um, yeah, really good. So, Tara, would you like to share your screen now and um, we'll hear from you? Sure. Oh, can you see that? Yep, looks good. Um, yeah, sorry. Can't... Just going to... There where it says slideshow. It's just the... Um... The panel's on top of my thing, so I can't see it. Oh, here we go, slide check. Very good. Um, morning, everyone. So I'm Tara and I work on our farm, family farm, Griffith, which is located um, on the Vic SA border near Uapa, so west of Horsham. Um, we're a mixed farming enterprise. Um, with merino, self-replacing merino sheep and irrigated and dry land cropping. Um, our average rainfall is 550. Predominantly, um, the rain is in the winter months and not a lot in the summer. Um, our soils range from sand, loam and black mulching country. So there's quite a variety. Um, our sands are pretty gutless um, and yeah, our black mulching stuff's a bit like Zoe. We've got a hard pan that we've got to try and break through and, yeah, just very, very um, tight soils. Um, so I guess the best fit that we've found for the mouldy species for our business is um, in the winter is a break crop for our cropping rotation. Um, we've got a big problem with ryegrass. Um, which I guess a lot of people around here do. Um, so we've found with the multi species, we can, um, or this one example, I guess um, we've, you that I'm going to talk about, um, 
we've used the multi species as a break to try and cut away the ryegrass um, at the end of the season. Um, also, yeah, we'll put in for the soil health that um, Jade's talked about in the first the first webinar, the um, nutrient cycling biology, um, breaking through that hard pan. And then also for the winter grazing, um, which over the winter in the pastures, we don't get a lot of growth. So the, um, the winter grazing is, yeah, very important for the sheep over that time. Um, and then the summer and spring option is more for the pasture renovation phase turning um, just the annual paddock, annual pastures in, pasture paddocks, um, getting them ready to put into a more of a, um, a long-term pasture down the track. The soil health, um, yeah, summer feed to fill that feed gap and then trying to get the roots in the ground all year round. Um, at this stage, we've found it hard to get any um, Multi species to establish over the summer if it's planted, yeah, November onwards, probably. So, the winter planting example I've got here is a bit like Zoe's blend, um, one of Grant's, the rye corn, wheat, peas, beans, vetch, brassica, clovers, radish. Um, we direct seeded this one in late April, um, dry. So we didn't have any sprays, we just went straight in. Um, we put 40 kilos to the hectare. Um, the fertiliser, we put a bit of SOA up front, liquid down the tube. And then, um, like Zoe, got pretty wet that year. But um, we did one early in-crop liquid spray. And then after that, got no love, but didn't really need it. It um, flourished and did its thing. So we grazed it. Um, Grazed up over the winter, I think they went in um, late June. And there's a little happy sheep there. Um, so went in late June and then came out ready to get um, to grow and then get cut for silage. So we were, yeah, very happy with the results. Um, we grazed till late August um, and then cut it for silage in October, um, which we use that silage over the summer if we need to, to get the sheep off, off the pastures to keep um, ground cover in the paddocks, um, just cause it's so dry. Um, and yeah, the plant diversity. And I guess the main thing for this, for that crop was, um, cause it was so wet, we couldn't get on it when we wanted to. So it did um, get pretty rank before we cut it for silage. So with the feed, we've got the feed test down the bottom here. Um, the ME was 9.8, which is not too bad, but I guess ideally it would have would have been nice if that was higher, which probably I imagine we would have got if we cut it a bit earlier um, before it went reproductive. So overall, yeah, we were very happy with the results. Um, the summer mix. We um, sowed it at five kilos to the hectare, millet, winfred, apen, chicory, radish, loosen, and plantain. Um, we brought a contractor did this one, so we couldn't put liquid down the tube, so we did 80 um, kilos of MAP. Um, and it, yeah, took off and got a great early start, um, got a good grazing off it. Unfortunately, the birds took, there was a fair few birds in the paddock. So we, um, we had got the one main grazing and then had to take the sheep off and spray it out for the birds. Um, we did get a rain during the summer and it did, some of the things did come back. So we got a, a second graze, which was a bit lighter. Um, and then now we've just gone in, um, so a couple of weeks ago, we've, um, gone straight into it with some rycon radish and clover to try and get some winter um, winter grazing off it and then we'll do another spring mix and then the year after we'll hopefully put phalaris and subclovers in ready for a um, permanent um, pasture. And that's about all for me, thank you.
Very good. Thanks, Tara. Um, yeah, we're running about on time now, which is good. So, um, yeah, good to see some some good results that you've had as well. So, um, good to see that, you know, we, um, when things don't go to plan, when you saw a summer mix, but then the weeds take over. But, yeah, good to see that stuff come back after the spray. So, uh, it was good. Um, now, I don't see any questions in the question box. Um, we've got a few minutes for question and answers. If anyone would like to ask a question to the panel, um, use the tab down the bottom, um, the Q&A tab, type it in there and address it to the panel. Um, while that's happening, have you got any closing statements, Jade, that you'd like to comment on, on either Zoe or Tara's experiences? Uh, I think they were both fabulous. Um, I'm, I'm really impressed with how the multi-species went, particularly I think um, what I do enjoy is partially because it got so wet um, and you couldn't put a lot of fur out is, is seeing how responsive they are with, with not a lot of love. Um, and I see that a lot. I see, I see the opportunity to drop inputs um, is, is quite large with the multi-species. They don't seem to need a lot. And I think that's down to their diversity and then the legumes that you can put in with them, um, giving them a bit of nitrogen just to keep going. So I think that the, the fact that you can have a really good result with relatively little inputs is, is a, a real game changer. And I think we've seen that with both your, both your presentations. So great results for you both, well done. I did have a quick, oh yeah, you've answered me. So um, I did pop up a, a quick question um, about Zoe's tillage radish. So the, the compaction layer was quite shallow and I wondered whether there was, um, whether they'd gone through that, but also popped a little bit out of the ground. So um, never, we, we haven't yeah. answered that question quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> so basically what happened was that uh, radish got pulled out by our son who was so amazed by it. So we never got to actually dig it out and see where the roots were going, which is um, a little bit disappointing. But at the same time, we were still amazed. It was, uh, yeah, he was amazed by how big it was. So. <laughs> Uh, there's one just here from, from Beverly uh, uh, to all the panel. Uh, what is it that has promoted or prompted you to start changing your practices? Tara, I'll let you go first. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess soil health and trying to get um, the soils, I guess, for us the most important to grow, grow the feed and feed the sheep and the crops. So, I guess, um, yeah, we're just trying to be softer on our soils and yeah, create a healthier soil is what we've been looking into and where the mouldy species and um, all our other um, things that we're doing is kind of the drive. Um, for us, I suppose it's uh, the first thing was to drop input costs. Uh, we really just wanted to reduce them. Um, Soil health, obviously, now we've started to work out the importance of our soil health and biological system. I guess that's prompted that. Um, and um, yeah, and to see healthy, happy animals um, in the paddock uh, has been a big one. And, and to see what you put in the ground flourish um, as, as not, a, not a monoculture, I suppose, as well. So, um, and to use it as a, a cash crop, um, you know, to, to benefit off it afterwards. So, yeah. Another one, <clears throat> another one from Beverly. How have you become aware of soil health? Uh, I'll, I'll quickly go. Um, I suppose uh, YouTube, um, Gabe Brown was our first introduction between him and uh, Ray Archuleta. Um, and then, um, yeah, Nicole Masters and then through, um, read all the, uh, all the books and yeah, so that's pretty much how we started. Yeah, the same. And now I guess podcasts and Big No Till and all the webinars and courses and conferences and just talking to other people. Yep. Yep. One here from Craig. Uh, what are your thoughts? of sowing permanent pasture in with your cover mix, clover, chicory and plantain? Jade? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, <laughs> it's fine, Craig. So um, often uh, if the paddocks, uh, an average sort of a paddock, I'll go straight in with some 
chicory and plantain especially and some perennial clovers. Um, they all establish quite well. I'll leave. I'll usually leave the grasses till later, um, till there's probably been a couple of annual multi-species, unless the paddock health is really, really good. But if we're going for um, an average paddock, I'll put the perennials in straight away um, in terms of the, the broad leaves and, and the clovers uh, and work towards the grasses. If it's a really challenging paddock, it might take maybe a sowing or two to get those um, perennials in, but certainly they establish really well in an annual mix and it's not, it's not, um, it, I, I do it quite a lot. So and, unless the paddock is really, really challenging, I'll usually put them in. I just might uh, make mention there too. I was, I forgot to mention before, wherever we let our, our uh, cover crop go to seed, uh, we've got a massive erodium problem and, um, you know, can't put sheep in some paddocks. Um, and uh, wherever we've let it go to seed and and it's and it's volunteered, so wherever there's volunteer multi-species crop this year now, um, there's no erodium. So there's been a complete shift in the in the soil structure and the erodium is not there at the moment. <laughs> it's not coming up. So yeah, I thought I'd make mention of that one. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is amazing the, uh, the power of crop competition and actually just having something growing. Um, I think that's that's the go with our weeds. I think they're trying to tell us something, uh, what's going on in our soils, and we just need to listen to them. And um, no, it's amazing that what does happen. So um, we're at the, <clears throat> past the top of the hour now, so I think there's no more questions that I can see. So we might might call it there. Um, really like to thank uh, everyone for their time, Jade, Zoe and Tara. I know it's a very busy time in the middle of cropping, so really appreciate your time. Um, really good to hear your experiences uh, with cover crops and multi-species. Um, some really good results there <clears throat> and also a few learning experiences. So they're not mistakes, they're learning experiences in my view. So, um, so we really appreciate your time. Um, Really big thank you again uh, goes to the Wimmera CMA uh, through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. <clears throat> thank you very much for your support. Um, just some housekeeping before we wrap up. Um, if you enjoyed today's webinar, uh, be sure to catch the next one. Uh, the advertisement, the link will be up on social media today for you to register. Um, the next one, uh, we, <clears throat> we are starting a six part series with Graham Hand on rotational grazing. Uh, it'll start same time, uh, 7 a.m. next Thursday. So, uh, yeah, he'll be talking about rotational grazing and obviously um, within multi-species uh, pastures. So um, we've also got a survey uh, that we'd like you to complete. Uh, the last one was emailed out. Uh, we've transferred that now onto an online version that should come up at the end of the webinar. Um, we're looking to gain your feedback about, <coughs> excuse me, about the, about the webinar so that we can improve them uh, into the future. So uh, if you could stick around and fill that in, that'd be much appreciated. So um, as we did last week, we're recording this one. Um, our, the webinar will be available up on uh, our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So uh, if you want to come back and view it again, or if you know someone that would like to see it, so head over to the, the YouTube channel and, and check it out. Um, thanks again for your attendance today. Uh, thanks again to the Wimmera CMA and Landcare. Uh, thanks, Jade, Zoe, and Tara for your time. Um, really appreciated. I think it was a really good session. So thank you very much, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, thanks everyone. See you guys.